Welcome to my economics channel, where I love discussing the subject, but most importantly, I love to make something fun and interesting to learn. And to that end, in this episode, I want to discuss the Industrial Revolution. And more specifically, I want to discuss working conditions. Because the Industrial Revolution is such a complex and deep topic, oftentimes it can be hard to wrap your head around it. And one of the things about reading the Industrial Revolution is that it is actually pretty hard to see in the data. And for the Industrial Revolution, from here on in, called IR, it is not that the IR represents a sharp break from the past, and then all of a sudden we had growth, people getting richer, happier, wealthier, and all that. What actually happened was that it was more gradual, and certain industries industrialized faster than others. And in today's episode, I actually want to delve deeper into working conditions. Because of the complexity of the IR and the common narrative told about it, we have this idea that people were enslaved, they were essentially forced into these factories to work for almost nothing in these hellscape conditions. And certainly that did happen for some people, but this masks a lot of the complexity that went on around this time. And indeed, this view of the world removes the agency of people back in that time. Because people back then, they did actually make choices. And some people indeed chose these working conditions over the alternative. But now that I've set the tone for the video, let's get into the video. Where's an iPhone made? It is designed in California, but the pieces come from Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, Korea, Taiwan, and China, as well as multiple points in the United States. In fact, in 2013, the US Labor Secretary Robert Reich claimed, based on Wall Street Journal data, that as little as 6% of the iPhone's retail value went to the United States, while 34% went to Japan, 17% went to Germany, 13% to South Korea, and a measly 3.6% to China. This is plausible due to industrialized production, where, at least in classical theory, Labor is divided internationally based on comparative advantages between economies. In other words, China can assemble phones efficiently and Japan can make the parts for less. The effect of this globalized production are many. One effect is that many goods and services are made much cheaper than they normally would be. Great news for buyers, of course, but what about sellers? However, another effect of this international division of labor is the transference of costs and profits. Prices can be lower because of productivity and efficiency. However, prices can also be lower because some of the costs associated with a good or a service can be transferred from the buyer to the manufacturer. At the same time, some of the profits can be transferred from the manufacturer to the retailer. And I bring all of this up because historically and structurally, this transference of costs and profits was never as jarring as it was in the 19th century, where artisanal production, basically production that happened in the home or in a very, very small workshop, where goods were produced for the local and national markets, was slowly replaced by industrial production for international markets. Basically, you had this big shift in the economy where people used to produce locally and on a smaller scale, all of a sudden, they are suddenly one cog in a larger machine that was producing for much, much larger markets, and especially, of course, the international market, as well as for the growing local market that England had at this time. This transference of cost and income can be observed in the behavior of national GDP per capita and real wages. Notably, even in an economically advanced country like the United Kingdom, productivity soared during the Industrial Revolution. However, real wages tanked only to recuperate in the 20th century. Moreover, these are average wages, and we would have to have a look at the distribution of wages to get an idea of how costs and profits may have been reconfigured in the English economy. While modern or contemporary measures of inequality are unavailable in the 19th century, there are multiple alternatives that we can use to get an idea of how quality of life during this period fluctuated. For example, we have discussed average income, but not child mortality which shows a very interesting trend. If the stats for children dying can be said to be interesting. However, while production and GDP grew throughout the entirety of the 19th century, especially in the UK, which we are studying, child mortality stayed relatively high until the start of the 20th century, when it dropped dramatically. Another very interesting statistic for us to look at is the average height of a fully developed man at this time. So height is determined by nutrition. And since malnutrition stunts growth and the human genius changes extremely slowly, the average heights of people are a great way to see how well that population is eating. On this note, the trends are similar. During the third quarter of the 19th century, 
Fully grown men in Britain average 5 feet and 5 inches, or 1 meter and 65 centimeters. By the third quarter of the 20th century, the average mature male height was 1 meter and 75 centimeters, or 5 feet and 9 inches. Yet another statistic that behaves in a similar manner is life expectancy. Throughout the entire 19th century, even though GDP soared and industries grew, life expectancy stagnated. It was only in the last quarter of the 19th century that it started skyrocketing. And this is what I mean by being difficult to see the IR in the data. If I had just shown you the data and not told you which dates it's from, you wouldn't know that the IR is supposed to represent a sharp break from the past. On the one hand, the IR represents the most accelerated process of change in the history of mankind. Just to put that in perspective, here is a graph showing the growth of GDP over the past two millennia. But on the other hand, this change was definitely not instantaneous. The virtues associated with modernization and industry, such as literacy, health, life expectancy, and income, appeared over the course of a full 200 years. Similarly, the ills associated with the IR didn't immediately appear, but were the result of long processes. The IR did not lift the world out of destituteness overnight, and the inequality that was produced in its wake did not appear instantly either. One record that is particularly useful is an article written by Eric Hopkins, published in 1982 in the Economic History Review. Hopkins recuperated multiple documents to rebuild how working conditions looked like throughout the 19th century in England. Hopkins extrapolates from Birmingham and the Black Country, which were some of the most densely industrialised regions at the time. What he found in Birmingham is quite interesting. Yes, there were some massive factories, but most of the quote-unquote industrial labour was actually done in small shops or at home, where workers would take pieces to work on them by hand. Very few industries used power. For example, there were multiple button manufacturers that used a single four-horsepower steam engine, and some used none at all. Another recurring topic is that of child labour. Child labour was actually quite common, however, only in certain industries. For example, John Turner, a button manufacturer, employed 160 employees, however, just over 100 of these were children. It is important to note that it is hard to establish just how harsh working conditions were for people in these smaller businesses, these smaller factories. For example, the workday was typically 12 hours long, with roughly 2 hours given for breaks, while children would work even more hours at home. So those are some bleak working statistics, however on the other hand there was also the common practice of Saint Monday which consisted of people refusing to show up to work on a Monday. So we have to throw another however in there because Hopkins estimates that one of the causes of this Saint Monday where you didn't work was that you actually did handicrafts at home for additional income which muddies the picture even more. And so at this time, increased demand, both locally and internationally, was met with additional labour, rather than additional mechanisation, with the exception of a few industries, like the textile industry. In fact, throughout the early IR, mechanisation was not actually at all common, and it was far more common for simply more people to be employed to produce more goods and services that the growing population needed, and the growing international market. To quote Hopkins, the most obvious ways in which productivity might have increased in domestic industry was by the adoption of more efficient hand tools or by the imposition of stricter worker discipline. So that was Birmingham. What about black country? Well, there the conditions were a little bit different. Birmingham manufactured guns, swords, toys and trinkets, jewellery, buttons and brass and copper crafts and other manufacturers. The black country housed large-scale ironworks, coal miners, brickyards, tanneries, breweries, and many non-domestic workplaces that were not compatible with the dynamics seen at Birmingham. The working day was about 12 hours as well, but each industry was different. Ironworks seemed to be focused on quality and consistency with regards to these new methods of working that came about, with men and children being paid as units. Basically that meant that you were paid based on either the quality or the quantity of production that you put in. Miners, on the other hand, had extremely arduous, dangerous and back-breaking labour. Since pikemen were paid by piece rates instead of unit labour, they chose how they wanted to work. Piece rates meant that you were paid by how much you actually produced, 
rather than the amount of labour or the quality of the labour you put in. Production was unreliable and undisciplined based on today's standards, and miners would commonly take up other work during the summer when demand for coal fell and many young workers overworked themselves during this time. And so to make a long story short, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is that Hopkins strongly disputes this narrative we have, whereby the IR represents a sharp break from the past and all of a sudden we have authoritarian and terrible working conditions that came in and that disrupted this old order, this easier order where people worked easier hours or easier lives in the past. The story is much, much more complex than that. And in fact, some of those older working conditions actually transferred for a lot of people throughout the period of the IR. This mechanical and authoritarian mode of production in large factories only apply to an actually surprisingly small amount of people. Even though, of course, it goes without saying that these were terrible, terrible working conditions. However, in dispelling this historical myth, Hopkins may have overextended by not addressing some of the significance of his arguments. And so, for example, the fact that miners or pikemen could choose how they worked does dispel some of the myths around the arduous and terrible working conditions of miners at this time. On the other hand, Hopkins recognises that workers paid by the peace would many times overextend themselves and in fact do nine days worth of work in four days. Naturally, workers getting paid by the peace didn't push themselves this hard out of some sort of sense of duty uh, to their country or to their employer or what have you, or because they loved the dangerous and strenuous working conditions. They did it because they had to. Also, if the labour market was as friendly as Hopkins portrays it, children would not be doing 12-hour shifts. Also, bear in mind that the improvements in the quality of life didn't actually come about until the 20th century, which means that many generations of people worked in these terrible working conditions and they didn't actually see the results of their labour. And so this is many generations of people that drove up tremendous amount of production at this time However, they would not live to see the benefits of their hard work. So even bearing these arguments against Hopkins' work in mind, that doesn't mean that the value of his work is lost. One thing is that the negative and the positive side effects of the IR did not come about as abruptly as is often taught in the history class or in the common narrative that we have of the IR. It took 100 years for industry to establish itself in England and then it took a further 100 years for us to see the drastic improvements in the quality of life. Furthermore, a topic that is not often discussed is the international division of labour. While quality of life in England did improve at an astonishing rate from the 1850s and onward, this is also a period during which the British Empire grew exponentially. While the idea that working conditions were akin to slavery for all industrial workers is a myth, as Hopkins demonstrated, it is also a myth that the entirety of production was carried out within a nation, especially a nation such as Britain. We would do well to remember that the British Empire is famous for holding both the strongest navy in the world and the most expansive colonial domain. So what can we conclude from all of this? So yes, for many people, working conditions were absolutely terrible, even if in some instances they got to choose how they worked. For example, coal miners. However, we also have the statistic whereby coal miners might work nine days worth of work, but do it in four days. And they certainly were not doing this out of the love of their job. We also have child labour thrown into the mix. However, it was not all industries that employed child labour. And in fact, many industries employed no child labour at all. For actually a significant portion of the period under discussion, even before 1850, mechanised production was actually not all that common. And so this also means that people were not thrown out of work. What was happening was that there was increased demand both locally in England and internationally, and this was met with more people working, more people doing more manual labour, and indeed doing 12-hour days, with roughly two hours for lunch and dinner. And so even though we also had Saint Monday, where people didn't work on a Monday, however, for a lot of people, this simply meant doing more work on that Monday rather than doing work for their employer. And also this idea that we have of the IR of massive factories employing hundreds or even thousands of people in hellscape working conditions can safely be discarded. And even by 1850, what we normally associate with the IR, that is the large factory which employed a lot of people in hellscape conditions, was actually not the norm. The norm even that late in the IR stage was actually for small and smallish workshops, which might only employ a dozen to two dozen people. And depending on which industry you were in, conditions could vary greatly. And it was predominantly in the textile industry that we see the rise and growth of mechanisation, and indeed some of the terrible working conditions. 
or they're maybe a little bit better than working in a coal mine. But my point is, and what I brought up at the start, was that people had agency. People had choices. It wasn't a matter of just being forced to work in a factory and that you were stuck there for life. People could and did indeed change jobs. And one thing that happened over the course of the IR was that factories started to move from the countryside, where they started, to cities. And one of the reasons was that in the cities where there were more people, not only was it easier for people to find jobs, but it was also easier for employees to find workers. And so there actually was a lot of competition for employees, and a lot of people were actually paid pretty well. Even though, of course, these people were paid these high wages for some pretty terrible working conditions. However, these terrible working conditions were not the norm at this time. And so what I hope I've shown with my video is that this simple story that we have of the IR and around factories and working conditions can safely be discarded. As that story also removes agency from people. People at the time had a surprising degree of choice of where and how they worked. And all of this contributed to the changing technology of the time and improving living conditions. Even though, as stated, the quality of life improvements really only came about in the 20th century. And so this is many generations of people who worked incredibly hard and contributed to this great change in society. However, they themselves would not see the fruits of their labour. And with that mixed bag of results in regards to working conditions and the IR in general, I'll leave it there. Subscribe, rate and share, and also hit that bell notification because that helps my channel as well. And in the next video that I'm going to be making on EE and in the next video in this series. Thank you for watching.